Quantum mechanics and general relativity are the two theories that basically make up our entire universe. But when we try to marry these two theories together, things stop making sense. This has led physicists to try and come up with a theory of everything, which would be one singular theory that satisfies both quantum mechanics and general relativity. Okay, let's start simply. Everything in the universe is either matter or an interaction between matter. The universe is made of particles, which we can now split into these two groups. We have particles that describe matter and particles that describe interactions. Particles that describe matter are called fermions, and particles that describe interactions are called bosons. With this, we have created a very simplified version of the standard model. The issue arises when we try to apply gravity to our little chart here. General relativity describes gravity. In classical physics, Isaac Newton defined gravity as a force in the equation of universal gravitation, which we used in high school physics. However, your high school physics teacher might have lied to you when you learned about the force of gravity. There is no force of gravity. Gravity isn't a force at all. Gravity simply describes the way that space-time is curved, and this curvature of space-time is what gives us the gravitational effect. This is Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now, remember, everything in the universe is either matter or an interaction. Gravity obviously isn't matter, so it's an interaction, and the gravity particle is called a graviton. This might be kind of hard to visualize at first, though. How exactly is an interaction a particle? Gravity isn't like a bunch of pieces flying through space. In order to wrap my head around this, I like to relate it to something that we're all much more familiar with, which is light. We know that Photons are light particles, but the sun isn't raining a bunch of little pieces on us. Light travels in waves. You can think of gravitons in a very similar way to photons, because space-time curves in waves. While we're on the subject, let's keep talking about light waves for a moment. How do you see anything? Right now, you're looking at something, and electromagnetic waves are bouncing off of that thing and into your eye. The waves then transfer information of what you're looking at into a picture of what your brain creates, so you can then see it. So seeing something is interacting with it. Now imagine you want to look at something that's much smaller, like an atom. Atoms are made of subatomic particles that you probably remember from chemistry. Neutrons, protons, and electrons. So all we have to do is shine some light on them and study what bounces back, right? Well, actually, the light wave is too big to hit these particles, and light will just pass right over them. So to solve this, we said, hey, why don't we just make the light wave smaller? Which did work, but the issue arises in having these shorter wavelengths, because that means that the wave has more energy. Therefore, when the wave hits the particle, it alters it. This means that by looking at a particle, we're actively changing it. Heisenberg's principle states that the more we know about a particle's position, the less we know about its momentum. We can think about this like you have a cardboard box that's face down on a table, and inside there's a tennis ball. Well, you can know, oh, its momentum is zero because the ball isn't moving, but you have no idea what its position is inside of this box. So now, how about you take a stick and you put it through a hole in the box and you can feel around for the ball. Well, once you hit the ball, oh, you know where its position is but you've also pushed it off in some direction, and you have no idea what its momentum is. So, the more you know about its position, the less you know about its momentum. And the more you know about its momentum, the less you know about its position. This is what Heisenberg's law proves. The position and momentum of a particle can be represented in a wave function, where the amplitude of the wave tells us the position of the particle, and the wavelength tells us the momentum. Most wave functions are going to have varying amplitudes and wavelengths, which will give us the probability of the particle's position and momentum. But say we want to determine the particle's position, there's going to be one single peak in this wave function where the particle most certainly appears. But now we can't figure out what the wavelength is because it's just one peak. There is no wavelength. So scratch that. Say that we definitely want to know the wavelength. We want to know the particle's momentum for sure. Well, we can create a wave that has one single wavelength all throughout it. That's a sine wave. But that means that we could have this sine wave going on forever with the same amplitude. Which basically means that it's equally probable to exist in any direction infinitely. So you can't know the position of the particle and the momentum of the particle. In fact, the more you know about one, the less you know about the other, and vice versa. 
Okay, so subatomic particles move in waves of probability. Let's draw another wave function, and this particle is going to have two peaks. So the particle has these two positions, and it's going to be in both of them at the same time until we measure it. This is what's called superposition. You might be saying, well, no, it's not in both positions at the same time. It's just probable to be in both places, and we don't really know until we've measured it. In which case, your assumption is logical based on classical physics, but down here in the quantum realm, things don't work like normal. We can see superposition in a famous experiment called the double slit experiment, where you have one wall with two slits in it and a wall behind that. Now, say you shoot something like a Nerf gun dart at it. Shoot a bunch of these darts at it, and some of them will get through the slit and they'll hit the back wall. Now, the back wall has two lines of Nerf darts on it. Well, let's do the exact same thing with electrons. If electrons really are just in one place at once, it should do the exact same thing, where some of them get through the slit, hit the back wall, you get two lines of electrons. But when we actually put this into practice, we get a very different result. You actually get a pattern of lines on the back wall, and it appears in their realm of probability. This is because the electrons don't actually act like point particles, they're acting like waves. You can see these visually with water waves and how you get this pattern on the back wall through it. This means that shooting an electron in this experiment is showing that it's going through both slits at the same time, or else you wouldn't be able to get this pattern. So let's just do this exact same experiment, but this time we'll put a tiny measuring device into each slit, and this way we'll see which slit the particle is actually going through. When we do this, we only actually find an electron in one or the other slits, but something else happens as well. The pattern breaks down and we revert back to the two lines on the back wall. Simply by observing this particle, we can no longer have it act like a wave, and it no longer can be in multiple places at once. There are two main interpretations of how these particles travel. The pilot wave theory says that the particle is in fact in one place at a time, and it uses this wave function to guide its position, while in contrast the Copenhagen theory is more widely accepted, and it says that the particle is in fact in multiple places at once, and the act of observing the particle is what changes it to have a finite position. Now, it's important to note that I am describing two-dimensional waves for simplicity's sake, because I really want you to be able to understand this, but the waves of probability are actually in three dimensions. We can imagine these particles more like a three-dimensional cloud of probability in space, but doing math with a fuzzy cloud of probability doesn't work very well either. So when doing calculations with these subatomic particles, we usually do refer to point particles defining the particle in one specific location where it's most probable to be. So what are these calculations we're making in quantum physics? Well, we can return to our table that we made much earlier, made of fermions and bosons. The standard model is actually built out of a ton of equations, all describing the different elementary particles and their features. Now, when we try to place the graviton into that table and use these equations to describe it, we get nonsensical answers. You can't actually describe gravity with quantum physics. In other words, quantum mechanics and general relativity don't work together. Now, let's take a look at our quantum field scan and try to apply relativity. The premise of relativity is that any mass in the universe causes some curvature in space-time, right? But these particles haven't been observed yet, which means they're still existing in multiple places at once, which is what we define with superposition. But does that mean that this single particle with this small amount of mass is creating gravitation in multiple places at once? We have no idea. You should also account that for our quantum fields, they carry amounts of energy between them, which means they should have related mass if we apply relativity's E equal mc squared. But that means that while we build up energy, we should also be building up correlated mass, which means we've made a bunch of black holes and the universe has collapsed on itself. So that's not what we want. <laughs> General relativity just isn't logical to use anymore once we've gotten small enough. This is what has led so many physicists to try and find the theory of everything, or a theory that can describe gravity through quantum mechanics that allows them to coexist without creating all of these theoretical problems. The quantum realm doesn't work with our general view of the universe, though, because quantum movement happens in jumps. We imagine our universe, though, to have analog space that we can divide forever and ever, 
But what if there actually is a unit of space that's the true minimum? The theories we have that attempt to reconcile both general relativity and quantum mechanics both introduce their own quanta of space-time, or the smallest unit in the universe. The first main theory that we have to describe gravity with quantum mechanics is called string theory, which you've likely heard of. String theory says that the smallest unit in the universe is a one-dimensional string, and these strings can vibrate in different patterns and directions. They can also be closed like circles or just be straight strings, but they will all vibrate in different ways. The math of string theory, however, says that these strings must vibrate in nine different dimensions, which is a whole extra six dimensions from our world. String theorists describe these extra six dimensions to be so minuscule that they don't actually affect our three-dimensional space. Instead, the shape of these dimensions is what determines the pattern that the string will actually vibrate in. The different vibrations of strings is what would create the different elementary particles in our universe. And this time, the graviton is included in these possibilities, successfully describing gravity in quantum mechanics. String theory creates a lot of possibilities with these nine dimensions it introduces, including the idea of multiple different universes that might even have their own laws of physics. If two universes were to collide, the amount of energy from the impact could explain an event like the Big Bang. String theory, however, gets a lot of criticism today for all of the possibilities that these nine dimensions open up. Some argue that string theory describes the possibility of anything, really, making it just a mathematical construct, not something that can actually describe our universe. The other large theory that we have that can explain both general relativity and quantum mechanics is called the theory of loop quantum gravity. Loop quantum gravity describes space-time as made up of a collection of teeny tiny loops that will link to each other at points. At these points is actually where three-dimensional space exists, but the loops themselves are two-dimensional. If we describe space in this way, then everything would flow in chunks from one quanta of space to another, like pixels on a TV screen. The minimum distance of the universe, according to this theory, would be about 10 to the negative 35 meters long. If you take a tenth of a centimeter and you split that into 10, you get a millimeter, which is probably the smallest unit that we'll use in the classroom. Now imagine taking that millimeter and splitting it into 10 more pieces, and then take a tenth of that, and after this 32 more times, that would be the quanta of space. Along with this, the minimum area would be 10 to the negative 70 square meters, and the minimum volume would be 10 to the negative 105 cubic meters. But let's go back to this loop structure. A collection of these loops is called a spin network. Space is dictated by the shape or the geometry of the spin network. The loops also can move inside of the spin network, and this movement is what dictates time. Each movement in the spin network causes time to tick 10 to the negative 43 seconds, like a digital clock with no amount of time in between. It just ticks one to the next. So when you combine the spin network shape and the movements, we call this a spin foam, and that would dictate the behavior of space-time. Now, when you add mass or energy to the spin foam, it will distort it, which will therefore distort space-time. And this is how quantum physics can explain the curvature of space-time through the theory of loop quantum gravity. No matter which of these theories you're going to be partial to when trying to explain the universe, the actual evidence of any of them in practice is basically non-existent. So quantum physics and general relativity continue to disagree with each other in any experiment we try to perform. So really, all we can do is try to come up with these stories to tell ourselves why.